Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is a pro revenge story. A couple of years back, on a different Reddit account, I mentioned being in an interracial relationship. Some douchebag messaged me calling me a race traitor and accusing me of betraying my race. I was like, what the hell, man? His account was six years old, so I figured the username was probably one he used frequently. I started googling combinations like username at gmail.com, username at yahoo.com, and so on. I hit the jackpot with a hotmail address for a guy named, let's say, Derek, selling NFL tickets. Didn't necessarily mean it was the same person, but in the ad he mentioned living in Chicago and being a Bears fan. Checking his Reddit history, he posted a lot on the Chicago subreddit, talked about attending Bears games, and mentioned being born in Toronto. So from the ticket ad, I had his real name. I found his work bio online. He was some senior manager, so they had a full write-up. It said he was born in Canada, loved the Bears, and lived in Chicago. I even found his LinkedIn and sent a connect request, which he accepted since he had like 500 connections already. Here's what I had. Username matched his email, Bears fan active on Chicago subreddit, born in Toronto. Same details matched his work bio. I then found his public Facebook. He posted borderline racist stuff there, and his Reddit history was way worse full-on hate speech and slurs. Given his management role where he probably made hiring decisions and his company bragging about being an equal opportunity employer, I knew I had to act. I called their HR tip line and said, hey, would you be worried if one of your senior managers was an outspoken racist who undermines your diversity policies? They were definitely concerned, so I told them I had receipts, screenshots, links, the whole nine yards packaged in a report. I emailed it over. A few weeks later, they said they appreciated the report, but couldn't share any decisions. No worries, I thought. I'll just keep tabs on this Derek guy's LinkedIn. Sure enough, a month or so later, Derek posts he's open to new opportunities. I message him on Reddit. Hey man, heard you got canned. That was me who got you fired, by the way. He threatens to hunt me down, hurt my family, yada yada. I report him to the admins. He gets permanently banned. Idiot didn't realize I could still see everything on his LinkedIn. So I update my folder on Derek with the new threat, because I can be a petty SOB when pushed. I check his LinkedIn weekly. Good news, he gets another job pretty quick. Bad news for racist Derek. Their HR is just as easy to reach. I have a real nice chat with this lady who sounded like she might have been a woman of color herself based on her name. Few weeks after that, Derek's online footprint gets scrubbed. His LinkedIn vanishes. And lo and behold, that new company's leadership team didn't seem to have a Derek listed anymore. I'm guessing they saw my receipts, gave him the boot, and he finally learned to STFU and stay off the radar. I would have 100% gone after job hash 3, but he stopped giving me reasons to. The next one is an entitled people story. My family has owned a massive ranch out in the countryside for over a hundred years now. It's been passed down from generation to generation ever since my great-great-grandfather first settled on the land. I grew up on that ranch, riding horses across the open plains and helping take care of the cattle. Some of my best childhood memories were made on that ranch, so you can understand why it holds such meaning for me and my kin. A few years back, I finally took over running the ranch after my father retired. I was eager to carry on the family legacy. At first, everything was smooth sailing. The ranch hands respected me as the new boss and the townsfolk were welcoming. That all changed when a newcomer rolled into town. Let's call her Karen. Karen was a stereotypical city slicker, complete with designer clothes and a miniature poodle in her designer handbag. She sauntered into town one day in her shiny SUV and fancy hat. Turns out she had just bought the property adjacent to our ranch. Karen made it abundantly clear that she looked down on our rural country lifestyle. At first, her snide remarks were easy to ignore. I figured she would just mosey on back to the big city soon enough. Oh, how wrong I was. Karen seemed intent on making as big a fuss as possible. She just couldn't understand why anybody would choose to live out in the sticks. Her snooty comments quickly escalated into petty complaints. She whined about the roosters crowing too early in the morning. She fussed about the occasional smell from the stables. No matter how minor the issue, Karen saw it as a personal affront. Things finally reached a breaking point one morning when I was doing my usual ranch inspection. One of the hands pointed out that part of our fencing had been cut and our cattle were wandering onto Karen's property. I quickly rounded up the livestock and repaired the fence, but now I had to go and speak with Karen. I approached her door and calmly explained what had happened. Before I could even finish, she exploded into a full-on Karen tantrum. She accused me of sending the cattle over on purpose to destroy her garden. 
No matter how much I tried to explain it was an accident, she wouldn't listen. Karen ranted and raved, her voice getting shriller by the minute. Finally, she declared that she was taking legal action. I would have to cease and desist all ranch activities, or she'd see me in court. Then she slammed the door in my face. I'll admit, her threats worried me at first. Our ranch was our pride and joy. I couldn't lose it because of some uppity newcomer's complaints. Thankfully, I had the law on my side. Our family attorney assured me that Karen didn't have a legal leg to stand on. Our ranch was there long before she arrived. Nonetheless, I wanted to solve the problem amicably without getting tied up in court. I even had a fence contractor come out and raise the height of our fence to placate Karen, but she remained convinced our entire operation had to be shut down. After her initial legal threats went nowhere, Karen decided to rally the other new folks in town against us. She stirred up stories about how our cattle were disruptive and our practices were unsanitary. Trying to get the law involved had failed, so now she was trying to sway public opinion to her side. What Karen didn't realize was that the old ranching families like mine went back generations in this town. Sure, some newcomers might fall for her complaining, but most townspeople remembered my grandfather and knew we weren't careless ranchers. The sheriff himself even dropped by one day while Karen was mid-tantrum about our disgusting noisy livestock. He calmly told her that ranching was vital to the town and had historical significance. She needed to stop her crusade immediately. That seemed to take the wind out of Karen's sails for a bit. She disappeared from her usual perch by the fence glaring at our ranch. But in true Karen fashion, she couldn't stay silent for long. A week later, I awoke to find Karen leading a protest right outside our ranch gates. She had cobbled together all the newcomers and a handful of our disgruntled ranch hands into an angry mob. They were chanting slogans about shutting down our cruel, polluting ranch. I'll admit, seeing that crowd stirred up some unease inside me, but I steeled my nerves and stepped outside, rifle in hand. I fired some warning shots in the air, scattering the startled protesters. Karen tried hollering that I was proving her point about us being dangerous and unhinged, but the townsfolk saw right through her dramatics. Later that day, I confronted Karen directly. I told her in no uncertain terms that she had crossed a line with her lies and troublemaking. Our ranch was staying put no matter what scams she tried pulling. She huffed angrily, but had no retort. After her failed protest stunt, Karen stayed quiet for several weeks. I hoped maybe she had finally given up. Of course, I wasn't so lucky. Her next move was to call in some environmental agency to investigate us for supposedly mishandling cattle waste. An inspector did come out, but surprise, surprise, he found we were fully compliant with all regulations. Karen's smug smile faded as the inspector gave us a glowing report. That was the last straw for me. The next time I saw Karen pacing by the fence looking for something to gripe about, I'd had it. I told her straight that if she kept up her harassment, I'd make sure she regretted ever setting foot on this land. Well... That finally seemed to shake some sense into her. Karen hurriedly put her property up for sale a few weeks later. I reckon my stern warning made her realize I meant business. Last I heard, she scurried away back to the big city where she belonged. Peace has returned to our little corner of the countryside now that she's gone. Goes to show you can't let entitled folks like Karen intimidate you no matter how persistent they get. As long as you abide by the law and stick to your guns, justice will prevail in the end. Karen might have fancied herself the queen bee around here for a while, but she was no match for generations of roots and respect for the land. This ranch is our legacy, one I'll proudly keep in the family for years to come. The next one is a petty revenge story. I've written about my piece of work, Sister-in-Law, before, but was recently reminded of this and thought I'd share. This happened in 2014. My husband and I had a cosplay-themed wedding. Guests were allowed to dress in costume or just be comfortable. The wedding party were dressed based on the TV show Firefly. My husband asked me to make his sister a bridesmaid and I agreed even though I don't like or get along with her. My only rule for what the bridesmaids wore was that it needed to be a character from the show and I didn't want any repeats, so they just needed to let me know who they were going to be so I could make sure we were all different. My sister-in-law knew about this before she agreed to be in the wedding. The other three bridesmaids all picked their characters and assembled their costumes with very little or no input from me. Leading up to the wedding, she kept asking me what she should wear. My husband and I both encouraged her to watch the show, it's only 13 episodes in a movie, to pick a character. She refused to watch even a single episode. There was even a time we were visiting and she asked us over to watch a movie we suggested this show, and she refused. I really just wanted this to be a super laid-back experience because we are not formal serious people, but she was making it difficult. She asked me a couple more times what she should wear and finally asked me to just send her some options to pick from. 
I spent a bit of time finding characters and emailed her a list, including screenshots and descriptions. I even took into account that she would be breastfeeding and would need an outfit that could accommodate that. I don't remember all the characters I sent, but they included the school teacher, the sex robot, companions, and a few others. Weeks later, she still hadn't even looked at the list and was asking me what she should wear again. I told her to look at the list, and she said she would. A couple weeks later, she's asking again. It got really annoying that she was refusing to put any effort at all into it. Finally, she told me to just pick who she should be, so I picked the pregnant prostitute. She didn't even bother to look the character up after that and still pestered me about what specific clothes she should buy. She didn't find out until after the wedding that was who the character was and she was really upset with me. I told her she should have picked her own character if it mattered. The next one is a malicious compliance story. I worked as a writer and editor for over a decade and in that time I had my fair share of bad bosses, like anyone. But there is one that completely takes the cake. I worked for a large media company that had dealings with a number of other companies and subsidiaries ranging from publishing to fashion to sports to tech. You name it, they did it. How our writing department worked was each writer would have specific areas that they would write for, kind of like how journalists have beats they cover. So, if you were assigned to the fashion arm of the company or one of its partner's subsidiaries, you wrote or edited everything for that arm. I worked for this company for about a year and a half before a new manager was hired. She was the second in command of our department. Part of her and our department director's job was to update our internal style guide when necessary. For those that don't know, a style guide is a reference document for how to either refer to things or how to format things for the company partners. Before her tenure as manager, this was only done maybe once or twice a year, and the changes were relatively minimal since the style guide was very well established in the company and had been in place for a number of years. After she came on, it was being updated at least once a week, if not multiple times a week. It legitimately became an obsession for her. Aside from the general annoyance of keeping up with it, it didn't take long for me and my coworkers to reach the conclusion that our new manager didn't have the faintest idea what she was doing. Each new version had more and more glaring errors. At first, we all ignored these changes, giving her the benefit of the doubt and hoping, albeit naively, that these new directives were mistakes. That was until people started getting reprimanded for not following the style guide. I was the first to get a one-on-one -on -one closed-door talk. One of the departments I wrote for was sports, and she had seen that I had not been following the new rule of how I was to refer to the men's and women's teams I covered. Truthfully, I had willfully ignored it, hoping that it was just a mistake. To my horror, however, it appeared my new writing manager didn't understand basic grammar. You see, the change she implemented removed the apostrophe from men's and women's. So, for example, if I was covering men's basketball, I was to refer to it as men's basketball. Her rationale was that the men didn't own the team, therefore it should not be possessive. Apparently, her understanding of the English language didn't evolve past grade school explanations. I was honestly pretty dumbfounded at first, but once I got over the initial shock that the second-in-command of our department didn't realize men's was not a word, I tried bleakly to explain that men is already plural and that a possessive es doesn't always denote direct ownership. Read, men's bathroom. She stared blankly at me for a few seconds, and for the briefest of moments, I thought maybe I was seeing the cogs in her head turn. She, however, doubled down. Realizing the fight was lost, I told her that I would implement the changes going forward. Now here's where my malicious compliance comes in. We worked for and with some very high-profile companies, and mistakes were not tolerated for things that were outward-facing. Realizing her idiocy could cost me my job, I made a simple request. Could you please email me the exact style guide rule you're referencing and how exactly you'd like me to implement it with examples of where I messed up? She looked at me like I was stupid for not understanding what was being asked of me, but she still wrote it all down in an email for me. I also made sure any further style changes were referenced in an email and specifically asked that if there were further changes to please cite how I had done them in the past, along with how she would like them to be done from now on. Sure enough, within about six months of this, I was fired. And at my exit interview, I handed HR a folder containing every written communication regarding the style changes, along with quite a bit of evidence that she was passing off her projects to other members of the department and changing people's work behind their back. She was fired three months after me, along with our department director three months after that. Turned out, my little folder sparked a full investigation by HR, and after interviewing other co-workers in the department, they realized she had done all of it to have grounds to fire people within the department she didn't like. I just happened to be the first on the chopping block. 
The projects she was passing off to other people, she was taking the credit for what they were doing to make herself look good, those changes she was making to other people's work, HR realized that she was changing things to make it explicitly incorrect. You gotta love software that tracks changes and timestamps and lists the user. On top of all of this, they also discovered that she had, at best, exaggerated and at worst fabricated large swaths of her resume. By the time she was fired, I had already found another job in a different department at the same company. It was a good gig, and my new manager wasn't a complete idiot. Eventually, I moved on from that company, but if anything, my time there taught me a very valuable lesson. Document, document, and document some more. The next one is an entitled people story. There's a guy who bought a drone a few years ago. High-end drone, which he learned how to fly. Not a problem until he started to fly it over all his neighbors' houses and lowering it to look in their windows. People call the mayor, the police, etc., and are told he isn't doing anything illegal. Lather, rinse, repeat. People talk directly to him and he insists he isn't doing this. Yesterday he did it again spying on a mom and her very young child in their backyard. The mother posted on FB calling it creepy because it's creepy. This time someone tagged the wife's name in the post and asked her to tell her husband to stop it with the drone already. She responded stating it wasn't him because he hadn't flown the drone in weeks. OP attached a video that clearly showed the drone landing in the creeper's yard. And at this point, the correct thing would have been to apologize and maybe speak with her creeper husband. But since this is an entitled group that isn't what happened, instead she corrected herself to state that he flew the drone in their yard only to do something with the battery. Someone else pointed out that the video clearly showed the drone crossing the street before landing, so that was a lie. Creeper's wife says he doesn't like to have to drive to a park to fly the drone. Someone else jumps in and reminds her that it's not about the drone, it's about him using it to look into people's windows and spy on them in their yards. Creeper's wife again states it's a hard hobby to have and this is where it gets good. Everyone realizes that this couple owns a business in town and in vague terms state that they'll be traveling out of town to get XXXX from now on instead of using the company right in town. Guess when you own a business that depends on people coming in for your produce, you might want to rethink being a creeper with a drone. The next one is an entitled parent's story. I gave birth to my son a whole month premature. It was spontaneous labor after a terribly horrible pregnancy. I had so many complications that I think my OB was amazed that I made it that far. My son went to the nursery for 24 hours for monitoring and then came back to my room. We left 48 hours later. My son was slightly jaundice. My milk hadn't really come in either, but the doctors were confident, and a nurse was scheduled to come see me two days later, so we went home. My mom had insisted she had to be there for the birth, and I decided to allow it. I regret it now, but that's another story. She left not long after the birth and refused to come see us after. On day five, she called and asked that I come for a visit. She lived one hour from me. I was still heavily bleeding, my son seemed a bit too sleepy for my taste, and we were waiting for the nurse. I told her so. She insisted I must come to her place. I placated her at the time by telling her maybe after the nurse's visit. Nurse came took one look at my son, gave me a bottle of formula, checked his coloring with a machine, called the hospital to give them a heads up that we'd be on our way, and sent us packing. While packing, my mom called back. I told her we needed to hospitalize my son. She then proceeded to tell me this story. When I had your brothers, three months early, they stayed in the NICU at the children's hospital for four months. Then they wanted to transfer them to a closer hospital, to where we lived, by ambulance. Do you know what I did? I convinced them to let me transfer them myself and swung by to visit your grandmother because that relationship is important. I'm autistic, and at the time, I didn't understand why she told me this story. If it's not direct, clear demands, I'm usually oblivious, which usually pisses my mom off. She told me later that I could have swung by on my way to the children's hospital. The thing is, I lived less than 20 minutes from the children's hospital, and she lived an hour away in the other direction. At best, she wanted me to delay getting my son treatments by at least three hours. I say at best, because once there, she wouldn't have wanted us to leave. She felt she was more entitled to my son than my son was entitled to be treated for severe jaundice. My son was brought right away to the hospital without delay and stayed for 24 hours under lights. We were sent home after that because my milk had come in. He was drinking plenty, his numbers had gone down, he wasn't so sleepy and we had showed a willingness to use formula as needed. We were to come back to the hospital daily for blood checks until he was cleared, which we did. My mom insisted that it was not needed and we could skip a day to let her see him. She never offered to come see him. Which could have worked. No, we had to drive to her. To be clear, she had access to a perfectly functioning car. We were willing to pay for parking. My house was fully accessible to her. She even had a key. 
We didn't skip a single day. She refused to talk to me for two weeks because she felt neglected. I got calls from three people telling me that I needed to be nice to my mom, that she had had a hard life. The next one is an entitled people story. I, 24F, have lived in the same apartment for four years. In this time, I've had two roommates, one the first two years I lived here, and the second for the rest of the time. My current roommate, 32F, V, has been great until now. She's in a long-term relationship, and over Christmas, she got proposed to. Now, they want to live together, but they both approached me and asked me to let her fiancé take over my lease and for me to find a new place as soon as possible. I have a few problems with this. I feel like they should find a new place together because I've lived here longer. I also told V a few months ago that I spoke to the landlord about once her lease together's up that I'll be living alone since I can now afford it. At that time, she agreed and said that her and her boyfriend would look for a place together. I told her this, but she said that when they started looking for a new place, that everything else was too expensive and it made more sense for me to move out and not her. I refused and told her that she can always ask the landlord if there will be units available for them in our building. She started cussing me out and has had her fiancé and their friends harassing me about it. There's four months left on the lease, so I'm just going to ignore them. But when I spoke to my mom about it, she thinks I should let them have the apartment since they need to start saving for their wedding. Comments said, not the a-hole. It's rude of them to assume that you'll move out when it's her BF who wants to move in. Stand your ground and tell her you understand, however, as said previously, you told her you were taking over the lease. Also, inform your landlord in case she tries to kick you off the lease when it's up for renewal. Another comment said, not the a-hole. They're well out of line here. It's one thing to ask you, but they didn't ask, it was a demand. Funny how everything is expensive, and yet they're happy to make it your problem when they're the ones with the change of circumstances. Worth giving the landlord a heads up on this, especially if she tries to take a sneaky route of making stuff up about you to them. The next story is titled, Am I the a-hole for responding to my father's request for a relationship with a detailed PowerPoint on why he will never be forgiven? If I'm the a-hole here, I'll own it. I'm not sorry, but like, it would be good to know because the rest of my family thinks this went too far. My, 24F, mom died when I was 7 from leukemia. I have very few memories of her from before she was sick, and I didn't get to spend a lot of time with her in her last year. But she was an artist, and until she couldn't anymore, she would make me little collages when she was in the hospital, with drawings and photos and messages for me. My grandmother put them all in a book for me after she died. I wanted to be like my mom, and my counselor thought it would help, so I started a journal where I would do kind of a similar thing, and I've done at least one page a week all these years ever since my mom died. More when I miss her or have something hard going on. So, I have kind of a unique record of my mental state over the last 16 years. My father remarried when I was 9. My stepmother really leaned hard into the, I'm your mom now, and my father didn't stop her. It improved when they had my half-brother because she basically forgot about me then. Unfortunately, he got cancer when he was 3, and I pretty much ceased to exist for my father. He was either working or gone with my brother, and I spent all my teen years mostly at home alone or with my grandparents. The mantra was that my brother needed to be the focus because he might die, so I needed to not be selfish since I was healthy. I stopped trying to talk to him when I was 16, and it was a dark time. I moved out when I was 18 and cut them off completely. My grandparents let me know that my brother died a couple of years ago, but respected my desire to remain NC with my father. He recently reached out to them because he wants to see me and talk. I went through my old journals and made him a PowerPoint with images of the entries where I had talked about being frustrated and feeling abandoned and unwanted, some with literal quotes of things my dad had said to me during arguments. Even the really dark stuff from when I was seriously depressed. Then I ended it with a photo of one of my mom's collages where she had written, Remember that your dad and I are always here for you. And I wrote, You failed. Go away. Underneath. I felt like him being able to see it from my literal perspective would communicate why I don't want him back better than I could. Evidently it worked, but a little too well because I've been bombarded by family telling me that it's understandable that I don't want to see him, but what I sent gutted him, and he's completely fallen apart after reading through it, and it was unnecessarily cruel. Maybe it was. I know my bar for that is kind of weird sometimes. So, am I the a-hole? Common said, not the a-hole in the slightest. You told your dad how you felt, and it made him have to confront his failures as a parent. It's not your fault he neglected you. 
He's upset because he knows what you put in the PowerPoint is the reality of how he treated you when you were just a child. Now that the truth is out and you have re-established NC, I hope you're able to let go of some of the anger you have at him and know that you did nothing to cause how he treated you. I'm no contact with my dad and have been able to find a lot of peace in the life I have built without him. I hope for the same for you. Another comment said, not the a-hole. Was it harsh? Was it a lot of effort when simply have telling him go away would have accomplished the basic goal? Probably, but this was your lived reality, and he wasn't interested in hearing or helping you when it would actually have made a difference. If it's only now dawning on him how lonely and rejected you must have felt, he's just going to have to live with that. Also, one does have to question whether he'd be this gutted or even reaching out at all if your brother were still here. The next story is titled, I, 24 female, inherited a lot of money from my grandparents. My cousins, 20s slash 30s, are demanding I split it with them. I'm risking losing my family if I keep all of it. Backstory. My grandparents have always been a big part of my life, as well as the rest of my family. They had five kids, including my dad, and have 13 grandchildren, six great-grandchildren. My grandparents are pretty wealthy. They owned three businesses up until last year when my grandpa passed away. I'm the baby of the grandchildren, and have always been really close with them. My grandma babysat me until I was able to go to kindergarten, I wrap her Christmas presents for everyone every year, I decorate their house, and I've worked at their bar on Friday nights throughout college, without pay, as they got too old to do these things themselves. All of these things were offered to my cousins, but they never helped out. My grandparents ran a horse training farm for show horses for over 40 years. This was something my dad took up with them, and I quickly started to love. I rode every weekend with my grandma up until high school when I started to get busy. Even though I don't ride much anymore, my dad and I go out and clean the stalls every week and take care of the horses when my grandparents went on trips, usually every other month. My grandparents were a huge part of my life. The problem. My grandma passed away four weeks ago. It was devastating. My grandma left my aunt's uncle's dad about $85,000 each, money that her and my grandpa worked very hard for. This was expected. What wasn't expected was for them to leave me a little over $45,000, along with some other things of value. I was honestly shocked. My cousins all got about $2,000 each and some knickknacks. Obviously, you can see where this was going. My aunts and uncles were in the reading when I was told, so they told their kids. Everyone besides my parents is furious. My cousins, who are adults, are demanding I split it evenly with them. I don't feel that I have to. I was very close with my grandparents and did a lot for them, but this is hard. My family is very tight, and we do annual vacations together, slash monthly parties, slash dinners, etc. I never expected money would tear us apart. This money could change a lot for me. I could pay off my $10,000 student loan, and put the rest towards my upcoming wedding, slash future children, slash a savings account. A small part of me wants to divide it evenly, just to keep everyone together. But there was a reason they left me this. They didn't do it to hurt anyone. I was the only one to visit them and help them out. None of them took the time to see them aside from family get-togethers. But no one understands that aside from my parents. I feel like I'm single-handedly tearing the family apart. My aunts and uncles won't talk to my dad unless I split the money, and my cousins won't talk to me. I only have a student loan and car payment, so I don't have much debt, but this could set me up for a comfortable future. They all keep throwing in my face that they have families, house payments, college to pay for, etc. They keep saying I've been planning this for a long time, but I truly haven't. I loved my grandparents. My fiancé is telling me to forget about them and to do what's best for me, but I'm a huge family person. I don't want to split the money, it could really help me, but I feel that they could be playing me by making me choose between them and it. My parents also want me to keep the money, as they feel my family members are being ridiculous by demanding this. Is it right for me to keep this much? I feel like I deserve it. Is it right for me to put this money over my family? Or are the people who I've been so close with my entire life taking advantage of me? $45,000 versus $2,000 is a huge difference. So. Advice? Comment said, absolutely keep all the money. Your cousins think they're entitled just because of lineage. They're not. Your grandparents gave you the money because you were good to them and spent time with them. You deserve the money, they don't. Also, like you said, this money can positively change your life and give you the good start you need. 
that's what your grandparents intended. If you split it, it's not going to be enough to help anyone. Honor what your grandparents wanted and keep the money. Use that line with your family, in fact. Our grandparents wanted me to have this money. I'm going to honor their wishes. I won't be discussing this further. If you want to let something like this tear the family apart, that's your choice. Honestly, you see these people a couple of times a year. They might be blood, but they are not your chosen family, and you'll probably find they matter to you less and less as you get older. Don't let their butt hurt ruin your chance for a good life. Another comment said, first of all, $45,000 split 13 ways isn't going very far at all. I don't think your cousins have really thought it through, but if your 12 cousins got $2,000 each and you got $45,000, then there was a total of $69,000 given to the grandchildren. That's a little over $5,000 each. They're seriously going to throw a huge fit about $3,000. A-holes. But anyway, duck them, they're not entitled to your money, and it's a crappy thing for them to do to be greedy idiots about it. Your fiancé and your parents are right. It's your money, and you shouldn't be guilted into giving it away. The next story is titled, Am I the a-hole for making my parents choose between my sister going to jail or replacing my car with their vacation money? I, female, 17, live with my parents. I have an older sister, 29, that they had when they were super young. Like, I think my mom was 19 and my dad was 18. They did not do a great job with her, and she has a lot of problems. She's chronically unemployed, and she's a thief. She has two kids that are okay. They live with us as well because her boyfriend didn't want them around. I like the kids, but they are spoiled little brats my parents dote on to make up for being crappy parents to their mom. My parents won't let me put a lock on my door because it's their house, and they don't want that. No problem. I talked to the kids and explained about what would happen if they came into my room without permission. We have an understanding. Well, my sister broke up with her boyfriend and she needed a place to stay. I begged my parents not to let her stay with us. They declined, so I begged again for a lock for my door. No dice. I have to go to school, so I can't guard my stuff at all times. When I came home on Friday, I found my car absolutely trashed and the sight of it destroyed. My sister had gone into my room, found my spare key, and taken my car. Then lost control on the ice after a day of eating crap and tossing fast food wrappers everywhere. She sideswiped a tree. When I saw my car, I was livid. I told my parents that I expected her to pay to fix it. They said she didn't have any money. So I said that I would call my grandparents. They had helped me get the car and insurance. After talking with my grandfather, I came back to talk to my parents. I said that the insurance would cover fixing or replacing my car, depending on the damage, but that I would have to file a police report, and that my sister would probably be charged for stealing my car. They begged me to tell insurance that she had permission. I said, nope. So rather than go through insurance, they are replacing my car. But they're using money that they had set aside to take me and my nieces to Orlando next summer for my graduation. It's fine. I can do without seeing Disney World again, but my parents, sister, and nieces are upset with me and saying that I'm an a-hole for denying my nieces the opportunity to go on a vacation that they have never had. I just asked them if a lock for my door would have been cheaper. Am I the a-hole? Comment said, Honestly, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking that we should just report it to the police and let the chips fall where they may. After all, sister did steal my car, and you are right that it's not fair to nieces to have to miss the trip because of sister's decision to break your trust and break the law. And the last thing I want is to be responsible for nieces missing out. So let's just report it to the police, not the a-hole. While I understand families deciding to handle situations like this within the family, rather than reporting it to the authorities, that is dependent on the wrongdoer being genuinely sorry for their mistake. But your sister isn't sorry. Not even a little. Otherwise, she would recognize that her choice took the trip away from her children, and not be constantly trying to guilt or blame you. The next one is an entitled people story. I'm 40M, just turned 40 last week. I'm divorced and have two teenage kids with my ex-wife, 17M and 14F. My whole family came to my and my GF's apartment last Saturday for my birthday party. My parents, some aunts and uncles, some cousins, my three brothers with their families, my two kids, and my GF's 15-year-old son who lives with us. I'm a recovered alcoholic. I've been sober for six years now. Alcohol absolutely ruined my life. It destroyed my marriage and nuked my relationship with my kids for years. I don't allow alcohol in my home now for anyone. It just isn't served or tolerated here. 
My entire family knows this very well, as they know my entire history with alcohol. For my 40th birthday, my brother bought me a very expensive bottle of whiskey. It had writing on it, a very heavy bottle, and very old whiskey, so it probably cost him a couple hundred bucks. When he gave me the bottle, I was shocked and said, I don't drink, but thanks for the gift. He then opened the bottle and started pouring shots in plastic cups for everyone. My daughter had a panic attack at the smell of the alcohol, which I am painfully aware is my fault and I will never forgive myself for it. So I told my brother to take the alcohol out on the balcony and just leave it there. He wouldn't do it and took a shot of the whiskey. I told him to seriously stop it and he proceeded to pour the whiskey. He then said I am acting like a sober saint now when I ruined everyone's birthdays for years with my drinking. I told him to come to the hallway with me and talk it out. He refused and put a glass of whiskey in my hand. I took the trash can, threw the whiskey bottle in it and plastic cups, and took the trash out. My brother then stormed off and my mom followed him. She later called me, demanding an apology for disrespecting my brother like that. My dad said I was being overly sensitive, and some of my other family members also agree. Am I the a-hole here? Comment said, not the a-hole. What your brother did is really, really awful and cruel. Possibly the worst gift I've ever heard of someone giving another, especially as he is aware of your struggles and recovery. Congratulations on recovery and standing up for yourself and your family. Another comment said, not the a-hole. Brother was being horrendously abusive and taunting. Read the room, dude. Especially the pain this caused the kids. Not a situation to double down on your bottle flex. Mom and anyone upset at OP can pound sand and get their juice on their own time. OP should have drain poured it to prevent them from dumpster diving afterwards. I say this as someone who drinks. The level of disrespect shown to OP here is off the charts. NC the lot of them. The next story is titled, Am I the a-hole for not giving my sister who's a single mom my share of inheritance? My, 35 female, last remaining grandmother passed away last month. That side of the family is Jewish, and it's customary to give inheritance to the grandkids in Jewish families. My sister, 27 female, is a single mom of three, one with special needs. All have different dads, none are in the picture. One is in jail, another was a one-night stand in Vegas, she doesn't even remember his first name, and the other is just an unemployed deadbeat. She's drowning in debt, mostly medical bills for special needs child, and got fired from multiple jobs due to having to always call out due to her special needs child having some medical emergency. She's months behind on rent, but landlord hasn't evicted her because he feels sorry for her. My husband, 42 male, and I are child free by choice. While we aren't Vanderbilt by any stretch, we do have a comfortable lifestyle. We were going to use my portion of the inheritance for a down payment on a house. We live in an apartment, albeit a nice one, and to treat ourselves to a nice vacation in Europe. I've never been there, but DH has, and I've always wanted to go. My sister's portion of the inheritance will cover some of her debt. She wants to pay off creditors first because they're threatening to take her to court, while the landlord is showing more leniency. But my family is saying I should give her my share of the inheritance because that would cover almost all her debt. She wasn't spending frivolously, it was mostly the mounting medical bills for my special needs nephew. And it's more important than a house because we're fine in our apartment and this is more urgent. I'm no prude or slut shamer, but bottom line is, my sister was reckless in having unprotected sex with multiple men and getting pregnant by three separate ones who for various reasons can't or don't help and that's not my fault. I don't feel my husband and I should have to sacrifice our dream of being homeowners, which is incredibly hard to do these days, and having to sacrifice this vacation I've always wanted to go on. I was responsible and think I made good choices, and I don't think I should have to suffer consequences for her poor decisions. Am I the a-hole? Comment said, not the a-hole. If you want to be both petty and generous, tell your family you'll match whatever money they give her. They probably won't give any, or at least not much, because it's a lot easier to be generous on someone else's dime. Another comment said, not the a-hole. You aren't responsible for your sister's repeated bad life choices. More importantly, if your grandmother wanted her to have it, she would have put it in her will. Another comment said, this is what I would consider if I were you. If you give your sister your portion of the inheritance, is that giving her a cushion for future monetary issues, or will it be a temporary fix to her long-term financial problems? My point being, this gets her through a year, then she's right back where she was. 
I'm also against slut-shaming, but the bottom line is we're all personally responsible for our life choices. She gets a reprieve with your inheritance, and you don't get your house or vacation. As another poster mentioned, your grandmother could have given your sister the full inheritance but didn't. There must be a reason. Not the a-hole. The next story is titled, Am I the a-hole for leaving my husband for a Christmas trip to Hawaii with our kids? Every year, my family spends our Christmas in Hawaii. We've done it every year since I can remember, and it's a fun family tradition for me. After me and my husband had kids, we had to reorganize our family Christmas plans because his parents wanted to see our kids for Christmas. So we decided that we would celebrate Christmas with his parents on New Year's and go to Hawaii for actual Christmas. This is the system that worked for us until last year. Last year, his dad passed away around this time of the year, and it hit him and his mom hard. For obvious reasons, we didn't go to Hawaii. This year, we planned out what we'd do for the holidays early. We'd do Thanksgiving with his mom, and we'd do Christmas in Hawaii since me and the kids missed out last year. Things were going well until right before our flight. About a week out, he said he was unsure. He said that he thinks it might be better that we stay. He said he really wanted to spend Christmas with his family and felt like his mom really needed it. I was unhappy about this, we planned, we saw her last month, and we already had my dad buy our tickets and hotel, so it would be incredibly unfair to me, him, and our kids for us to not go just for his mom, who we'd see a few days after we got back anyways. We got into an argument about it and proposed that me and the kids can go to Hawaii and he can stay there with his mom. He decided to do this, but he was very clearly upset that I wasn't going to forego my family's Christmas tradition and seeing my family just for his mom. So now I'm in Hawaii watching and wrangling the kids by myself while he's home alone. He hasn't texted me or responded to me much. When I call him, he only talks for about three minutes before wanting to get off the phone with me and talk to the girls. Am I the a-hole? Comment said, I think not the a-hole because you stayed home the first year after his dad passed away and you had agreed to the Thanksgiving Christmas arrangement for this year. He changed his mind after all the arrangements were made. However, I think you and your husband need to talk about this more. Where are he and his mom in their grieving processes? How does he envision things working in future years? Does he want every Christmas with his mom now? Does he want to do alternate Christmases? Or is this year just particularly hard for both? Also, is there an option to have your mother-in-law join you in Hawaii since she's on her own? Another comment said, I feel for your husband. He lost his dad a year ago and his mom is spending Christmas without her partner. With plane tickets bought and hotels arranged, a week out is not enough time to change plans. I agree with you about not wanting to cancel and taking the kids to see your family. I do think you need to cut him some slack here, though. The holidays can be really hard for people who have lost loved ones recently. I think you're all doing your best in this situation, and I don't think there is any right answer here. Hopefully your husband can join you next year, and maybe you could have a conversation about that when you get back. The next story is titled, Am I the a-hole for wanting to bring my cat back into my house after wife's late stillbirth? My wife and I were expecting a child in October. We are in our early 30s and have been trying for a child for some time. Due to character limits, I won't get into details, but it has been difficult. In February, we discovered that she was pregnant. Obviously, we were over the moon with joy. We began to prepare. We did everything you could possibly do to get ready. We planned a baby shower and sent out invitations. We prepared a beautiful room with a custom-made crib by my father-in-law, who is a very talented woodworker, and we were extremely thorough in baby-proofing our home. During the baby-proofing, my wife started to suggest that we get rid of my cat Bubba, who is 12 years old and I've had since he was a kitten. I got him in college, I adopted him, and each of my two sisters adopted another kitten from the same litter. Bubba is extremely affectionate to me. So sweet and cuddly. He tolerates my wife, but is not affectionate towards her. To strangers, he is not nice. He's never bitten or scratched anyone, but he does a lot of hissing and yowling at people he's unfamiliar with. My wife was afraid that he'd scare the baby, he wouldn't be welcoming to a newborn, or that he'd hurt her. I argued gently, but eventually acquiesced. In her 28th week of pregnancy, we sent him to live with my parents. He was not happy there. My parents said he cried all day and walked around meowing 24 hours a day looking for me. Tragically, my wife and I lost our child just weeks before she was due. We still don't have a lot of answers and it's painful to get into. We mourned. We were inconsolable for weeks. I still cannot think about it without feeling complete agony and loss. After a month, we returned to some level of normalcy, as normal as things could be anyway. We've started to explore adoption. 
Last week, I told my wife I was going to pick up Bubba to bring him back home. She exploded. She said that under no circumstances would she allow him back in our house and that I had agreed to have him live with my parents. I missed him. He's been my best friend for years. He's been my loyal companion my entire adult life. She told me that I could pretty much choose between her or Bubba. I told her that obviously I would choose her, it's not even a question, but that I didn't understand her reasoning and I felt she was being cruel. She'd lived with Bubba for 10 years and there had never been any problem. The adoption process can take 8 to 12 months on average and I'd like to spend that time having Bubba around. We haven't spoken about it since. This is the first fight we've had. Am I being unreasonable slash the asshole and wanting my cat back? Comment said, not the a-hole. You should never have to get rid of Bubba. I'm sure to you, Bubba is also an important part of the family. Cats hissing is not a sign of violence, but a sign of fear. My sister, who recently had a baby, has a cat who also hisses at strangers, but is cuddly with its owners. Honestly, he can't even tell that her baby is a human at all and only ever sniffs her or avoids her. On top of that, a child will not be afraid of a cat unless they are raised to be or are horribly hurt. A tiny scratch will not traumatize a baby. Another comment said, not the a-hole, but also, I'd like to say that adopting a replacement for the child you are mourning is awful too. I'm that adopted child, and it's crappy. Another comment said, not the a-hole. You miss your cat and want it back. For you, that sits on its own. Your wife is dealing with the loss of the child that was inside of her. The knowledge that it's her body that is preventing that happening again, and I can tell you that no matter how strong everyone is on the it's not your fault message, that blame gets internalized anyway, and an uncertain future facing adoption. For her, the return of the cat is linked and could be taken as you are giving up on any future child, especially since, presumably, you'd have to get rid of it again if you did in fact adopt. I think emotions are running high here, and you need to talk through them. Do consider though if this is the best for the cat in the long run if you're just going to return it to your parents' house at a future date if adoption is successful. Good luck. The last story is titled, Am I the a-hole for not disclosing I had plastic surgery to my boyfriend? I, 26 female, have been dating Max, 25 male, for 4 months. When I was 22 I had a nose job as I broke my nose twice as a kid and it left it with a large bump. Then, at 23, I had a breast augmentation that bumped me up two cup sizes. These were lifelong insecurities that I was bullied over, and it was really relieving to get them done. On to the present, I met Max through a friend and things have been great. Last night, I was strolling through my social media while on the sofa with him. I stopped on an old classmate's vacation photo where she wore a bikini and, frankly, had very obvious implants. She looks great, happy for her, but you can tell. Max glanced over at that moment and said, Gross. I asked him what the deal was, and he said women who get implants or other surgeries are a huge turnoff to most guys, and how men prefer natural over two balloons, and how insecure she looked. I couldn't help but laugh and said, so you're turned off by me? He got very confused and asked what I meant. I informed him I had procedures done before. He kept denying it and saying I was joking until I showed him old photos of me. He got quiet and left shortly after. I got a text saying I should have disclosed this on the first date, how I led him on and that he needs to reconsider things. It's the next day. Haven't heard anything. I'm bewildered. Am I the a-hole? Common said, not the a-hole. It certainly wasn't his business on your first date. I'm assuming he's seen your boobs by now, and if he hasn't noticed, I don't know why he cares that much. Another comment said, not the a-hole. You sprung it on him when he was trying to act like women with implants turn him off. Most guys like pretty noses and large breasts whether or not surgery was involved, which is why so much cosmetic surgery is paid for by husbands and boyfriends. He's licking his wounds. The next one is an entitled people story. Enjoy the cold, searing revenge a year later. Setting, 1982 Los Angeles metro area. I was a six to seven year old girl. My grandpa bought me a cool toy airplane. It was a green dual propeller fighter plane made of metal. I took it to school one day for show and tell. I had researched the plane and who flew it during which battle, etc., and was ready for my report. I took it out at recess. This little crap Victor asked to play with it. Then he wouldn't give it back. I cried and complained to the teacher. The principal got involved and said I must be lying because girls don't play with that stuff. He refused to look at my proof. 
the report I wrote for the presentation. So, Victor, smirking, got to take it with him. I was not able to do my report and got a zero on the assignment. I was ahead in reading and other subjects, usually a teacher's pet. I was not used to getting poor grades or being called a liar, so the incident was devastating for that reason more than the loss of the plane. My mom came to pick me up from school and I told her what happened. She immediately parked and stormed the principal's office and tore him a new one. We showed him my notes for the report. He apologized and went to look for Victor. Well, Victor was gone by then. The principal said there was nothing the school could do to make him give it back. I was pissed. I was like, can't you give him detention until he returns it? But they were wimps about it and told me to drop it. Victor would make airplane noises and make his hand into a little airplane around me when no one else understood what he was doing. He was a little sociopath. I hated him, but was pretty powerless about it. Fast forward about six months. My mom started working 16-hour shifts on weekends only, and I would get babysat for the whole weekend, spending the night. I was at one couple's house for about a year, but they tried to baptize me against my will without telling my mom. She was pissed and fired them. She had to work the next weekend and was desperate for a babysitter. Fortunately, a friend pointed her in Consuela's direction. Consuela, let's call her C, was a 50-something-year-old grandma with a 100 kids at her house. She would watch at all hours. She had a bunch of teens and 20-something-year-old boys of her own. She was originally from Mexico, and they spoke almost exclusively Spanish. C was a hard-working woman. She also had a full-time job during the weekdays and did great with the kids. But she had a temper. Her boys were slovenly and would mope about. She would holler at them. When she hollered, we all fell in line. Or, you got the business end of her wooden spoon. Sometimes she would yell at me, but I didn't understand as my Spanish was pretty rudimentary. I was taking it in school and had quite a few Spanish-speaking friends, but when C would yell, I would get stressed and not understand. I usually would just hide under the bed and stay out of sight. I realized after a while that C was mostly bark and got used to her after a while and learned how not to piss her off. She called me her good girl, and I rarely got in trouble. But I harbored some hard feelings toward C, as you can imagine. One Saturday, after about six months of staying at C's house on weekends, Mom drops me off, and who do I see in the living room but Victor? I was like, oh, hell no. Now I have to be around this little crap and try to avoid getting yelled at all weekend. Ugh. But then a plan came to me. I observed that Victor didn't speak much Spanish. He was half Mexican but lived with a non-Spanish speaking parent after a divorce. And he was out of his element. Gone was the smirking butthead. He had big eyes full of fear. The first time C went off on one of her boys in front of Victor, he was stunned. The son got fired from his job, and when he told her, she chased him around the house with her spoon. He was twice her size and was completely cowed by her. Victor surmised that if that big guy was scared of C, then he better stay out of her way. C was a great cook, but she used the cheap cuts of meat and cut corners to feed all those kids. The next day after Victor started coming, a Sunday, she gave us sandwiches for lunch. As an adult, I love avocados, but as a kid, I thought they were grody. She handed us a chicken gristle with a huge slab of avocado. One simply does not refuse to eat C's food. It is a surefire way to get hollered at. Victor ate his in the other room unobserved by anyone. I took a few bites in front of C to show her I was eating it. I looked for a way to dispose of it, like give it to the dog or something like I usually did when I didn't like what I was given, but the dog was out with one of C's sons. Then the plan all came together. C's son, who was at home watching TV, got up to go to the bathroom or something. I lightning fast hucked the sandwich under the son's easy chair where it would not be seen. Then I go about my day and go back home that night. I see Victor at school all week, and he went back to his smirking BS about the airplane business from before. That Saturday, we were back at C's house all weekend, and he's the meek little angel like last weekend. 
She goes into the TV room and says, What's that smell? In Spanish, I froze up. I was scared, but this was it. This was my moment. I was all innocent. P.U. What is that? She made her son get up from the easy chair and lift it to find a nasty, moldy sandwich. It was hot outside and C didn't have air conditioning, so that sandwich was a fetid, molded mess. C whirls around with a cracked glare and looks around at us kids. Everyone scatters but me. I said innocently, Tia, I saw Victor in that room with his sandwich last week. Maybe he dropped it on accident. With sweet, good girl eyes. She laser focuses on Victor, who runs for his life. Victor, get back here! He climbs a tree, and she can't get to him. He spent some time in the tree and wouldn't come down. She went inside to call his parent to come get him. I made eye contact with Victor and made airplane noises and smiled. In that moment, he knew I had orchestrated the whole thing. I never saw him at C's house again. I would see him at school, and he never messed with me again. Epilogue, Inception Revenge. When C came back into the backyard to tell Victor his parent was coming, a dead mouse got flipped into her shoe. Flip-flops. She was mortally afraid of rodents. I watched fascinated, likely smiling evilly, waiting for her to notice. She noticed my gaze, looked down, and saw the mouse in her shoe. She screamed and hollered. Later that day, I caught her looking at me, scrutinizing me. I think she understood the depths of my planful evil in that moment. The next story is titled, HOA Karen Calls 911 on Us for Using Public Pool. I Get Her Arrested for Tax Evasion. People are different all over the world. In every single place, even the smallest village has that annoying neighbor. In my neighborhood, we have a Karen, who is one of the worst neighbors you could have asked for. She is the richest in the neighborhood because she won half of it from the lottery, and the other half comes from her late husband. She always makes sure to remind us how rich and amazing she is. She does all kinds of things to annoy and upset everyone on a daily basis. There is an indeterminate number of times that she called the police on the neighbors, never with a good reason. The neighbors told us multiple stories. One time she called the police on an old woman that lives next door to her because she was annoyed that the old woman's children were visiting too often. She also told everyone in the neighborhood that she is allergic to pollen and that no one should plant flowers. I was absolutely stunned because I'm also allergic to pollen and I can't even imagine saying that to my neighbors. She accused all the neighbors of different crimes. She accused a man of being a drug dealer, claiming that she had bought drugs from him and that she was forced. The police came and searched the man's house, but they didn't find anything. She called the police on another neighbor when he bought a new car, claiming that the neighbor stole that car from her. She even accused a neighbor of sexual assault, but every single one of these accusations were false. But wait, her stupidity doesn't stop there. She was caught multiple times sneaking into people's yards, looking at them through their windows, and taking photos of them. She was also caught taking pictures of people at the public pool, almost daily. When anyone confronted her, she always said, I'm in public, I can photograph whatever I want. She always assumed that she could do anything she wanted just because she was rich. And she kind of did because no one wanted to argue with such a stupid person. She always managed to get out of every situation just because she was a white, rich woman. Everyone in the neighborhood had at least one altercation with her because she targeted everyone. She wanted to prove that she can do whatever she wanted. The story dynamic changed when my family and I moved into the neighborhood. We are a middle-class family like most of the people in the neighborhood, but in the eyes of the rich woman, we look like the poorest people ever. She hated poor people in general, but mostly the ones that were living in the same neighborhood as hers. Our family consisted of my mother, my father, and my brother and me. I was 16 years old at the time of the story, and my brother was 10 years old. One day she came to our house and knocked on the door aggressively. My mother opened the door. Hello, can I help you? My mother asked. Yes, you could help me by moving somewhere else. You know, I hate poor people. 
and you all seem very annoying, she replied. I'm sorry, but I can't help you with that, my mom replied, while closing the door. She went home angry, and you could see in her eyes that she was thinking of how she could make our lives a living hell, too. One day, my brother and I were going to the pool. She was sitting on her porch, apparently selling lemonade. I decided to be the grown person and buy from her. We entered her yard and looked around. Two cups, she asked. Yes, thank you, I replied. It's cool. What are you doing here? I added. The lemonade stands, she asked. Yes, it's awesome. Do you do it every year, I asked. Yes, every summer with lemonade and all year with other drinks, she replied, preparing our lemonade. Oh, a small business. I love it. Are the taxes big for something like this, I asked. I don't pay taxes for it. It's just a stand of drinks, she replied. You ask too many questions, boy, she added. I didn't reply as I felt that this information was good, and I could use it any time needed. We paid for the lemonade and went to the pool. We noticed that she walked behind us until we arrived at the pool. She then took a seat somewhere close to us. She took her camera out and started taking pictures of my brother as he was swimming in the pool. Every time she saw that I was looking towards her, she pretended to do something else. I didn't know the purpose of what she was doing was, but I had to stop her. What are you doing, you creep? I shouted. Photos at the pool. Am I not allowed to? She asked. You were taking pictures of my brother, I replied, screaming. Give me the camera, I added. No, get away from me, she shouted. I grabbed the camera from her hand and started looking through the photos. I was right. She was taking photos of my brother. I never wanted to be a bully because I knew how bullying felt, but I had to do it. I showed everyone the photos, and we all laughed. I tried to make her feel bad and realize the severity of the problem. As an answer to out-bully, she called the police on us, telling them there were some thieves, some bad kids, that trespassed and came to the pool. She told the police that the thieves were harassing her, making her and everyone at the pool feel unsafe. The police came and discussed with everyone at the pool. I told the police about how she was taking pictures of my brother, and everyone at the pool backed me up. The police quickly understood how the situation really was. The situation was cleared up, and the police gave her a warning for calling the police for no reason. She got really angry, and she left the pool in a rush, but I was still angry, and I wanted revenge. She had to pay for her behavior, and I was going to make her pay. I went to the police and told them about her little business. The police took statements from the other neighbors who confirmed that she was selling drinks all year long. Apparently, she was doing it for almost two years now and never paid her taxes. The police took her stand and all her other utensils and arrested her for tax evasion. Everything made me and the other neighbors happy. The last story is titled, Divorce Revenge, Husband's Story. With his first wife, he bought a house five years before they ever met. When they married, she started cheating on him shortly after. He didn't know. Dude, she was cheating on him with his best friend. Her and the boyfriend came up with an idea to get husband to put her name on the title and refinance the house. This was back during the last housing boom. She ended up spending the money on her and her boyfriend. During this time is when he found out they were together. He kicked her out and started divorce proceedings. She had legal connections, so basically took him to the cleaners. In the decree, stated he had to refinance and get her name off the house. By that time, the housing market had crashed bad, and he was not able to refinance, even after trying several times. As years go by, and he had moved out of state, but kept the house as a rental since he couldn't do much with it. Her and same boyfriend got married and wanted to buy a house, so she wants her name off the old house. She takes ex-hubby to court for in contempt of divorce decree, since he wasn't able to get her name off the house. Went to court to plead his case with proof of trying to refinance multiple times. Her connected parents knew the judge that ruled he was in contempt, had to pay all associated fees, pay her off the house with all lawyer fees, and spend five days in jail. Funny thing is, after he was released, he was in a perfect position to file Chapter 13 bankruptcy and include said house, refinance loan, and all lawyer fees in bankruptcy. Who do you think the banks and lawyers went after for the money then? Stupid idiot. The next one is an entitled people story. 
So when I was around six years old, I lived with my family in a nice house in a small city in Poland. It was a quiet neighborhood on the outskirts, and pretty much all the neighbors knew each other. There were no sidewalks around the part of the street I lived at, only one crappy sidewalk that started on the other side in front of my neighbor's house. It's important to remember that the sidewalk was very old and in bad shape. Still to this day, people are asking the city to fix it. The story is about that neighbor, Karen. She was an older lady. Everyone suspected that she really didn't have anything better to do than gather gossip and disturb everyone trying to rule the street. Everyone was commenting that if you wanted to get the whole area to know something, you had to tell her that message as a secret. Whenever someone came to visit us, they usually parked their car in front of our property. But on bigger meetups like barbecues or parties, people would park in front of our closest neighbor's house too. That was never a problem. No gates were obstructed and no one was disturbed. Well, almost. Karen hated when someone parked in front of her house. She would always run out yelling about how we dared to park our filthy cars on her precious sidewalk. My mother is not someone that lets someone yell at her. She had many discussions with Karen about the laws and rules that stated that she doesn't own anything outside her fence, which means that the sidewalk is public and anyone can park on it as long as they leave enough space for a wheelchair to pass. That wasn't enough. Every time someone would come to us and park their car there, the yelling would start. Until one time when my mother's friend, Tomek, came for coffee during winter. He's a local policeman, and his specialty is road law. So my mother tells him about Karen and her behavior regarding the sidewalk. Tomek laughs since that thing was in such bad shape that it can barely be even called a sidewalk. When he was leaving, he assured my mom that he would stop by the next day for a coffee on his lunch break. Next day comes by, and I was playing with my brother in the snow. We see a black car pulling over in front of Karen's house, and as the driver gets out, Karen storms out of her house yelling, You can't park here! This is my sidewalk! Get your filthy car off my prop! Well, there he was, Tomek, with his full uniform, hat, and all, turning around towards Karen as comically as he could. Excuse me? You tell me that I can't park here? Yes. But this sidewalk is open to the public. Yes, this is my sidewalk. So let me get this right. This is your sidewalk? Yes, and you are the one responsible for taking care of it. Well, yes I am. That's why I don't allow anyone to park here. Oh, that's so nice that I found you. Since it's your sidewalk, you're responsible for clearing the snow from it to not create danger for the people walking on it. Since it was not plowed, I need to write you a fine for endangering public safety. He says as he pulls out his notebook. But no other sidewalks are plowed. Oh, it doesn't matter. The other sidewalks belong to the city. The cleaning crew is working on cleaning them. But since this sidewalk is yours, it's your responsibility. But I'm old. I can't shovel the snow. Then you need to hire someone to do that. Of course, if this sidewalk happened to be a public property... Yes, it's not mine. But a moment ago, you were yelling at me, saying it was. So what is it? Is it yours or not? Because I don't know if I should fine you now. No, it's not mine. All right, it seems like we cleared that up. Now, if you ever harass anyone like you did with me, it could result in a fine. So I recommend that you watch out on what you claim to be yours. And then he proceeded to cross the street and enjoy a coffee in our house. Karen never disturbed anyone for parking in front of her house again. She would only stare at people trying to burn holes in their skulls with her sight. The next story is titled, Want to Block My Driveway, Officer? It's going to be another minute or two on coffee. It was a crisp and chilly morning about a decade ago, and I began my early morning shift at a fast food restaurant. We opened at 6 a.m. sharp, and I had to be at work at 5 a.m. So I'd leave my house around 4.45 every day without fail. My management was relatively relaxed about the opening shift. And as long as you showed up ready to go, 
Clocking in up to 10 minutes late wasn't really an issue. But on this particular day, things took a dramatic turn. I stepped outside at 4.45 a.m. to find that a local police officer had pulled someone over and was now blocking my driveway. This wasn't the first time this had happened, but normally it was in the afternoon and I could simply ask the officer to move their car a few feet forward or back and I would be able to get in or out of my driveway with ease. However, this officer was different. He was angry and informed me that I would have to wait until he was finished. I was already running late and couldn't afford to wait any longer. So I snapped a picture of the officer's car, texted it to my manager, and explained the situation. I thought that would be the end of it, but I was wrong. Forty long minutes went by, and the officer finally moved his car, leaving me to scramble into my own car and head to work. I arrived at the restaurant just 15 minutes before we opened, frantically brewing tea and fetching ice, trying to condense my 50-minute routine into just a quarter of the time. I was moving so fast that I almost forgot to start brewing coffee. As soon as opening time rolled around, the first group of customers came in, and it was a group of our local police officers, led by the captain. They were about to do a shift change, and I recognized one of the officers in the group as the one who had blocked my driveway earlier that morning. The captain ordered coffee, and I regretfully informed him that there was a five-minute wait on coffee because I got to work so late. The captain asked why, and I showed him the picture I took earlier that morning, explaining the situation and how one of his officers had blocked my driveway for 45 minutes for a routine traffic stop. The captain proceeded to chew out that officer in front of all of his colleagues, exclaiming that nothing short of a life or death emergency should block my driveway if it was going to interfere with him getting his morning coffee. I was relieved that the captain took the situation seriously, and I thought that would be the end of it. But it wasn't. A few weeks went by, and I started to notice that the same officer who had blocked my driveway was still patrolling the area and pulling over cars, sometimes for no apparent reason. I became frustrated and decided that it was time for me to take matters into my own hands. I remembered the picture I had taken of the officer's car that morning, and I started to do some research. I discovered that the police department had a policy against officers blocking driveways, and I also found out that the officer in question had received multiple complaints about his behavior. I decided to take my findings to the captain. And with all the evidence I had gathered, I presented my case. The captain listened intently and was shocked to learn that one of his officers was breaking department policy. He took immediate action and the officer was demoted and transferred to another department. It was a satisfying moment for me, and I felt like I had finally gotten my revenge. The captain always got his coffee at 6 a.m. without interruption and I had made sure that the officer who had caused so much inconvenience and frustration would never block anyone. The next story is titled, Entitled Grandma Can't Stop Whining About My Photography. Let me first introduce the characters as not to make the story confusing. Me, a 20-year-old university student studying photography and videography. Entitled Grandmother, not my grandmother, she is my cousin's grandma. Cousin, he is recently married and has a three-year-old kid. I have been a hobby photographer, albeit not that great, for a couple of years now. I finally had the chance to up my game, and I was gifted a camera from my parents. I'm so grateful for that. Anyways, I'm now in my third year as a student studying photography and videography, but I am not confident enough in my skills to be a paid photographer. Cut to my cousin's wife asking me, why don't you photograph our son's first birthday? That was said a few years ago, and so I began doing that. Honestly, it was a great experience, and I learned a lot. Yes, I do it for free, but it was good experience, and my cousin and his wife promised to me and recommended me to their friends. I think it was a good idea. So cut to a few days ago. 
it was my cousin's son's birthday, and I'm supposed to be the photographer. Everything was going fine. I went early to take pictures of the kid before the people came. Cut to the kid's grandma coming. It was fine at first, but then she came and confronted me in front of everyone in a super mean, loud tone. Entitled Grandma, You're a horrible photographer. Don't take pictures. Someone else will take them instead. Me, Excuse me? What did I do to you? Entitled Grandma, You never sent me any previous birthday pictures. You give them to everyone, but not me. Give me your camera. I'll make someone else take pictures. She tried to take my camera, but I refused and told her it was mine. She got mad and then started yelling every time I took pictures. She yelled things like, someone else here, and then takes the person and puts them in front of me and takes pictures. This person, me, is such a horrible person that never sends me pictures and takes awful pictures. I was honestly so confused because I always sent the pictures to my cousin and his wife. Before I had my camera, I used to use my cousin's camera, and he had all the photos in his SD card. That was what we agreed on. I didn't know what to do, but she kept interrupting my field of view, and I honestly missed out on taking some great shots. I honestly didn't care at this point and just tried to take as many shots as I could until the party ended. E.G. kept yelling until I left and then came back home. She even messaged and told my siblings horrible things. I sent the pictures to the whole family afterwards, and she received them and then demanded for the previous birthday pictures. I told her they weren't with me and that she should check with her grandchild and his wife for the images. She got mad. Honestly, that experience was hell, especially since I was doing it for free. I guarantee you, if I was doing it for money, no one would let her act like that because there's money on the line. Every family and friend just let her get away with it, because she's an old lady. Like what? That's so unfair. I also found out that these people post the pictures without crediting me. And last I checked, they've never recommended me to anyone. At least I got some experience out of it, and I could say that I'm a really good photographer with kids, which is a nice plus. I've decided to start charging people, even if it is family, because it's not worth it anymore. They would have definitely treated me more professionally if there was money on the line. Thank you for listening. You guys are honestly wonderful, and taking this time out and having people understand really makes my day. I hope I'll become a good photographer someday. The next story is titled, Steal My Amazon Package? Enjoy your complaint investigation. I work from home. Receive a notification on my phone that my Amazon package has been delivered. It's a couple hundred dollar item, so I immediately go outside, but no package anywhere. I was outside as the delivery van was driving away, so literally no way a package thief snatched it in 20 seconds. That Amazon driver is two houses down. Excuse me, I received notification that my package was just delivered, but it's not there. Driver looking shocked, stammering over words, Oh, uh, what's the address? Give him the address. Yeah, I just delivered it to you. No, you didn't. I'm calling Amazon and you all can sort this out. Start walking away. Driver calls out, Oh, I found your package. But it says there's an issue and I can't deliver it. It's likely a duplicate, and another driver will be by later to deliver the correct one. Then why did you mark it as delivered? Oh, because I didn't see that there was an error. The other driver will be by later. No, I'm calling Amazon now. Walk away, call Amazon to report the incident. They say nothing is wrong with my package, and it's marked as delivered. I tell them about the interaction, and they say the driver should have given me the package. Even if it's a duplicate, the driver is not supposed to withhold a package. They'll investigate and get back to me in 24 hours. Two minutes after getting off the phone with Amazon, doorbell rings. I happen to be next to the door, so open it within five seconds to see the same delivery driver hauling ass down my driveway. Jumps in the delivery van and speeds off through the neighborhood. Look down and my package is there. Call Amazon again to let them know I just got the package. And it was the same driver who hauled tail. 
They said they would be opening an investigation into the driver. I also told them about how fast he was driving through the neighborhood. I felt like a Karen calling to complain, but truly believed this driver was running a package stealing scam. Mark's package has delivered. Customer says they never received. Driver says, well, a package thief probably stole it before you looked for it. The last story is titled, The Craigslist Karen. A few weeks back, I was selling a cell phone on good old Craigslist. I had tons of hits, but Karen came in first and said she'd come to me immediately. I told her to come on down to my work. At the time, I was in my own little trailer as the place I was remodeling, and it was slow season. My final message to anyone buying from me is a confirmation of price. Just so we're clear, the price is $400, and it comes with X, Y, and Z. No response. Spidey senses start tingling. About an hour later, Karen shows up. Karen, I'm here for the phone. I had the phone charging on my desk, so it was ready for the inspection. The phone was flawless. Karen picks it up and looks at it, is scratching at non-existent stuff, giving that little sniff of disapproval, then says, It's a little rougher than I thought. Me. It's been fully encased in Invisishield from the minute it was taken out of its box. There's not a scratch on it. Karen. Well, it's not worth $400. Me. That's the price. Take it or leave it. Karen. I only brought $250 with me. You take it or leave it. I had taken the phone back after her inspection, so at this point, I put it in my desk drawer. Me. Leave it is. Have a nice day, Karen. Excuse me. I drove almost two hours to get here, and I took time off of work to pick this up. Me. That's super neat. It's still for sale at $400. But if you need to pick up more cash, just about every bank you can think of is within a few miles. Karen. I want to speak to your manager right now. Me. Sure thing. Two trailers over, door on the right. Have fun. At the time, I was selling insurance out of a dealership and had a good friend of mine was the desk manager, my boss. As she stormed out, I messaged my friend boss about the crazy lady coming his way. A few minutes later, my desk phone rings from my boss. Boss, Minja, did you refuse to sell your phone to this lady? Me. Yep, she wouldn't pay the agreed-upon price. Boss, are you willing to negotiate the price? Me. Nope, I already have other offers for full price. Boss, ma'am, we appreciate your time, but the price is firm at $450. Karen in the background. What? He said $400. Boss, and you only brought $250. Sounds like you're short either way. Look, I can work a deal out for you here. If you pay me $200, I'll get him to sell you the phone for $250. I could almost hear gears turning before she said, Duck you, and left slamming the door. Message from the boss. Don't sell crap that isn't insurance at the dealership. Retard. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.